Katie Hopkins, Josh Cohen, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well indeed. I'm here in New Jersey, um, ready ahead of a of a rally tomorrow tomorrow night. Yeah, here in New Jersey. Brilliant, beautiful. Well, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm coming to you from beautiful uh, Minnesota. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking time for me. I know you're you're really busy. So uh, I know you um, you're really busy, and I'll uh, we'll just jump right into it if that's okay. Of course. Awesome, Katie. So <clears throat> I'd like to start. Obviously, you've been called uh, many things over the years, haven't you? Uh, media personality, commentator, columnist. I think I'd be desperate to know, Katie, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> well, those were kind of that, um, I've been called, you know, the biggest <laughs> bitch in Britain uh, and much worse besides. I get the angry Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> I get the female Farage. That's not so bad, except I have better teeth and better breath than Nigel. Um, so many, many names and not all of them terribly kind. Um, I think I now describe myself really, you know, I'm a journalist in the truest sense. In that I spent my time I was on the road, listening to people and telling their stories. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what I do. I also see that I've become some freedom. I'm probably one of those individuals that's known in that area as someone that's trying to defend the freedoms that we love. So, so my name, I suppose, Katie Hopkins, has become a little bit of of one of those names that's known for. For getting in the face of things and um and standing up for freedom yeah brilliant i love it um it, obviously you kind of launched into the public consciousness uh katie when you appeared on i believe it was the third season of the apprentice back in 2007 and uh i'd like to know what exactly was that experience like um how did that come about yes so i had gone from my military background, I joined a consultancy firm and I'd been asked to set up the US arm of their operation. So I lived on the in the East Village in Manhattan on 14th, actually, which is where the fire trucks run. So the sounds of sirens, actually, I find quite relaxing. Uh, still. <laughs> oh, you cut, set up you cut out just a little the, bit there, Katie, uh, sorry. For the company on Madison Avenue and I lived Okay, and so I set up the business uh, in America and worked out of Madison Avenue for five years. And um, in those five years, I watched this brilliant program called The U.S. Apprentice with this great guy who had this swathe of bright red hair. And I thought, oh, he, he's the guy for me. I love him. And so when I went back to the U.K., I applied to be on the British version of the show. The British Apprentice. Now, The British Apprentice is nothing like The American Apprentice. There is no Donald Trump. There is no fabulous job offering at the end. In fact, I'd argue there isn't really a job. Um, it's a very different kind of program, and the candidates are mostly idiots. <laughs> so I thought I would come out like somewhere in the middle, you know, looking like the kind of reasonable girl that people thought, oh, she's kind of, you know, she's all right. Um, but in, fa in fact, I got to the end of the process and myself that I was about to be offered you know I was offered my place in the final uh, for a job that I didn't really want um, and so I was the one that then fired the boss so I became known because I was the candidate that fired the boss mm -hmm. uh, the first apprentice candidate to fire the boss and, um, and and that's how I became known but in terms of the process you know back then it was 12 weeks of living in a house with people you dislike that you're competing with you have no freedom whatsoever. You are chaperoned at all times. They take your phone, your money. You don't own anything or have anything. You become very much um, a product of the TV show. And so there's a whole other level to filming an Apprentice series that, that goes well beyond doing tasks. Uh, and it's more about the, the need of a show to create the illusion of a business-based you know, reality drama. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, being a being a product of the show. Uh, that must have been a an interesting experience. Um, after yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. And I was naive back then. You know, I was naive, and I I honestly thought it was a sort of competition for a job, but but that actually turned out not to be the case. You know, it turned out to be much more the case that you're a product of a show, 
and that that's the most important <laughs> thing to them it just so happened that i was a useful product for that show sure yeah they're they're, they're building out a package that they're trying to commercialize and you're simply a, a cog in that machine right yes and of course in mm -hmm. hindsight i see that and know that now but way back then as a 28 year old that had never been involved in tv um and let alone, you know, realize what, what the mechanics of media involve. Uh, it was quite a different thing. I thought I was genuinely going on a program to show that I was pretty useful from a business perspective. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, following your appearance on The Apprentice, Katie, obviously uh, that was when you sort of really launched into it as being a columnist and a commentator. I know you were with uh, News of the World, um, LBC, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'd love to know how you were able to parlay your appearance on The Apprentice as being a into being a commentator on British politics. Yes, and I became so when I became known as a face that, and the reason I became known, I suppose, was on The Apprentice. I was known as the candidate that said what I thought about the other contestants and other candidates, <laughs> and wasn't very forgiving in that. Uh, I was very direct. I thought everybody else was doing it as well. It turns out that wasn't the case. And so if somebody was an idiot, you know, I would be very direct about that and explain to the camera direct that I thought they were idiot and an idiot and not competent. Um, so so that went along. And, and, that, and, and because of that, I ended up kind of becoming this, I guess, personality that was known for a spirit people say unfair in, in my views but really I was very blunt so I ended up on morning TV on a range of subjects speaking my mind um, and the reason of course that that worked and the reason that I became then better known or some something of sort of the public conscience is that I said the things <clears throat> people were thinking but were too polite to say and that in an American sense is refreshing and would be refreshing now. We don't have that actually, we don't have that person anymore. But in a British sense, if you think about British politeness and British manners, you know, it was kind of revolutionary to have somebody sitting next to someone on a sofa, looking them in the eyes and just leveling this stuff directly at them. You know, that was became better known and eventually through my writing and other things that's when I became a columnist and I also landed my own radio show so it was an evolution of becoming someone that that sort of had the <clears throat> the sense of where people were at and I and I, and I say to my supporters still you know the reason I can do what I do and the reason I do what I do well is because of my supporters it's because of the people who email me it's because of the people who message me and tell me their stuff that's the reason I'm still in touch with how people are, how people are feeling, you know, and the mood of the nation. And that's exactly what I'm picking up here in America. Yeah, absolutely, Katie. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, love to get into a discussion about your, your general social views. Uh, we could probably go on all day about that. Yeah, um, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm especially interested to get your view on obesity. I know you've caught a lot of flack for this and uh, definitely want to excavate that and, and chat about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... I especially would love for you to talk uh, as much as you feel comfortable about your journey putting on, I'm, I'm going to screw up the conversion, <laughs> but however many stone it was. Yeah, no, you're fine. <laughs> so, you know, I think first is a preface um, as a true libertarian, you know, mm. uh, I don't care what anyone wants to do with their body uh, or how they want to live their lives or their preferred sexuality or anything. None of that is any of my business whatsoever. I'm very, very clear about that. Uh, and if people want to be 18 times the size they should be, that's also not a problem for me at all. Like that's absolutely fine. Um, but under socialized healthcare, as Americans are increasingly aware mm -hmm. and will be if Biden ever gets anywhere near the presidency, I am obliged to pay for the treatment of others. In the UK, I'm obliged to pay for your personal choices. So whatever your personal choices are regarding healthcare, I'm about well, I do have an opinion that is valid because mm -hmm. I'm picking up the tab. So I've always had the view that if you want to feel better about yourself, it is possible to eat a bit less, but move a lot more and feel better. And what I actually want is people to feel better. Mm. And that, that message actually is what's carrying me through this last three and a half months. I just want people to feel better. And it's not about weight right now, it's about lockdown. But 
back then. So what I did, I set up with um, a, a TV company. We're like, well, what project would you like to do? And I was like, you know what? I'm sick of being told that I'm lucky to be skinny. Uh, I'm sick of paying for large people to have new hips and gastric bypass and all the rest of it. I'm going to prove that if you want to lose weight, you can. So I put on half my body weight in three months and then I lost it again in three months just to prove that if you want to do something about your shape, you can. That I'm not lucky to be skinny. If choose to eat a bit less and move a bit more. And really the purpose of that was to try and hit at the excuses that people use. So when things are challenging in our life, you know, we all want an excuse. And that's true of being larger as well. Like, oh, it runs in my family or I've got big bones <laughs> or the medication I'm on. And I, I get it. I get it. Yes. I was on, I'm epileptic. I was, I'm on, I was on medication that could kill a horse. You know, um, people say I look like a horse as well, but that's unrelated. <laughs> um, all of the excuses you can have, right? And all I wanted to do was chip away at those and, and say, well, mm. even if that, then you can. Even without that, then you can. I haven't got any money. That's fine. Here's mm -hmm. a pair of sneakers. Let's do this together. I haven't got the time. Okay, I understand. Let's set our alarm clocks an hour early and we'll walk. Um, you know, it runs in my family. Okay, well, let's just take you and let's see what happens. So it was about knocking away the excuses and asking people. And it's a joyous journey. I mean, I loathed putting on the weight. It was terrible and awful and disgusting. I hated myself. And I actually, I wanted an excuse as well. That's, I think, one hmm. of the interesting things is I wanted the excuse that everybody else had. I wanted to tell people I was doing a TV program and I couldn't. So, um, you know, it, it was one of those things. I, I got much more, a better understanding of what it's like to be overweight. And I also got a much better understanding of what it feels like when you don't feel good about yourself physically. And on my journey, we brought people with us that came on, on the journey and lost a lot of weight as well um, and started a Katie's Fat Club and the Fat Club were doing brilliantly. So it was really just about, uh, sort of it was a learning thing for me, but it was also about hitting stuff head on. And I guess even my critics will acknowledge that um, I am the sort of person that puts my money where my mouth is. Um, and, and that involves the places other people won't go, sleeping on Skid Row, right. you know, going to the George Floyd Memorial and, and going to dark places in order to tell the truth. Well, that that's true of my fat story as well. That's amazing. Um, I had a few people that had asked me to ask you, Katie, uh, how did you go about losing the weight? What was your regimen like? How long did that take? Yes. And actually for me, and this, this sounds annoying to people, but putting <laughs> on the stone is actually... Uh, for someone like me who burns stuff and is is sort of slimmer it it was that was mortifying and hard and horrible and i had the volumes that i needed to do to to put that weight on was something else and the photos i mean show a tortured so the commitment was three months so that was non-negotiable and the other commitment was none of the stuff that you know so-called celebrities would have so no personal chef no gym, mm -hmm. no financing, no money, no diet plan, no nothing. It's just a pair of sneakers and steps. So 10,000 steps a day. And, and then obviously I would do more than that because I had a timeline. But <laughs> what I was trying to do was get, bless you, was Thanks. bring people with me on this. Um, and the idea was just to walk. And I would say this now, look, to anybody that's at all interested, if you did no steps today, let's just say you did none, that's not a problem. Uh, let's see tomorrow, see if you can do a hundred, mm -hmm. you know, and then tomorrow and maybe the day after that or a week after that, maybe see if you do a thousand steps. And that's all this is. It's, it's that idea of incremental positivity. And actually, um, if we park the whole weight, fat, whatever, emotion, right, is incremental positivity. It's so important for us right now because things are very hard and things are very tough yeah and we're losing people all the time because people can't see a way through so i think that in a way my new journey is is a similar idea but different which is about bringing people together reminding people that ours is the side of joy 
and the ours is the side that wants to make people feel a bit better. Mm-hmm. So actually, you know, there's so many parallels and, and that's what's proven to be true since I've come on my journey. I've been three and a half months nearly on the road. It's just been a lot of joy of bringing people together, getting them to feel better, breaking the back of getting people off Zoom and into being in person. Uh, and it's been it's been terrific. It's been, you know, it's been epic yeah. uh, in that way. Oh, that's fantastic, Katie. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to, to broaden the discussion a little bit uh, towards freedom of speech. Um, when you were here in uh, my fair state last month, I, you gave a speech and I asked a question to you regarding uh, operating as a journalist in a country that doesn't have freedom of speech, right? Britain, yeah. Britain does not have freedom of speech. Um, and I think I'd like to ask you just in, in, in plain words, just to kick us off, uh, yeah. would you consider yourself an absolutist for the freedom of speech or do you think that freedom of speech should have boundaries? Yeah, I, I can't see that freedom of speech should have boundaries. Um, I think there may be a case that people need to, uh, you know, if there is a platform out there that wants to um, provide that platform for people, I don't think that we can have boundaries on it because those boundaries, as I've seen myself, that I've been removed from most things, yes. those boundaries have then become the very rules that have people removed from these platforms. Um, so, of course, I mean, I think there are levels of, of engaging in terror where ISIS and we're encouraging people to Mm -hmm. commit acts of treason against the government. Clearly, I think there may be a way of delineating that. But in terms of offence or something that would be marked as hate speech or something that would be marked as, you know, inappropriate, no. I don't think there can be boundaries in that way. Um, And my concern for my country and great British people is, you know, that we are at a point where people self-censor at the point of speech. It happens in America too. So people think stuff, but they won't and can't say it, Mm. you know, because they're frightened. And I think what the lesson is for someone like me, who's been, you know, almost, you know, sacrificed by the state, whatever it is they do to me, you know, take your jobs, your home, your children, come for your head, uh, encourage the assassination attempts. What, What that is more, it's not just that they want me to swing from a tree, which it wants to use me as a learning device for others, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, I become the schooling mechanism. You don't want to be like Katie. You know, look what happens if you speak out. Look how humiliated she is. Look how we have damaged everything she had. Look how her pride has been hurt, right? right? And that's what they do. And and you see it here as well. You know, it happens in America. You you have people here that have been cancelled or lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. I had a gentleman in the airport on my journey here to New Jersey who came up and said, you know, he mentioned to a colleague about a book he liked. And later on, it wasn't Mein Kampf, you know, it was like an interesting book. And later on, he was hauled into HR because his colleague had reported him to human resources for liking a book. And it wasn't even a political book. You know, th- these are terrifying times. We we aren't that far away from the first of, you know, September 1939. You know, th- mm. these are dark times. But we all know it, and we're all feeling it. And I and I know people are feeling it. And I, you know, I feel the need to try and help rally people and remind them that we we will get through this. But right. Oh. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, uh, speaking for myself, I've never understood the idea that offending someone or the possibility of offending someone should supersede my right to say something. Um, you uh, you know, we talk about Islam, which I have some, some time blocked off for, you know, later, whatever anyone's opinions are on Islam, they should be your own and you should be free, feel free to express them. No one, no one complains when Christianity is, is being criticized, for instance, it's a double standard. Once you try to put limits on speech, then then it, it takes away anybody's ability to speak. And I don't think it's just about the right to be offended or to offend. Mm. You know, people just need to make better choices. And my concern is that it is too late for us in the UK. You know, we're not going to get our speech back. Right. But once it's gone, it's lost. There is no, there's no recovery of that thing. 
it's not coming back. And so that's why I spend so much time here in America, because in as much as I'm a patriot, I'm proud of my country, I signed up to the military to fight for it. Those freedoms don't come back. Mm -hmm. So if we lose, ever lose the Second Amendment, we never get it back. Yeah, it's not a sort of, oh, we lost it in this decade, we'll get it back in the next. It's gone forever. Yeah. No, I, I agree. It seems to me that there's, I think every generation has a fight for the freedom of speech. I mean, I'm, I would imagine you're familiar with Salman Rushdie and the satanic verses and, and that whole um, saga, you know. Um, yeah. So that was that was theirs. Um, let me see. Uh, actually, on, on that point, um, I'd like to, I have a question that a friend of mine wanted me to ask you, Katie, regarding British politics. Uh, let me just make sure I read it right here. Yeah. Um, my friend David would like to know, Katie, uh, who in your view was the last true conservative prime minister? Um, do you see anyone in the political sphere currently that you think could bring conservative values back into the UK? Uh, no, there's nobody currently that would be a true conservative. The last conservative uh, prime minister that we had and leader was Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And that's not going to be a surprising answer to anybody. <laughs> um, and some people I know, and you know, Thatcher, not only did she break the mold, you know, and was a female leader without ever feeling the need to mention or acknowledge that she was a female. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what an amazing thing. But she was unique and disciplined in the sense that she was a conviction politician who knew she didn't need to be liked. So she was willing to make the unpopular choices and be unpopular for it. Um, you know, she was the last prime minister who truly took us into into war in the Falklands War, mm -hmm. but in a way that was honourable and noble and, and was a risk, but a risk that made our nation feel great again. Um, so she was the most, she was the only true conservative I've ever really known in my lifetime. Um, and we won't, I don't have anybody like that. Hmm. Now, many Americans who are indulgent of Nigel Farage, <laughs> and bear in mind, he is the gentleman that got us Brexit, um, or got us to the point of nearly getting Brexit. Right. Because we're not there. He, he appears as that true conservative, but actually he would need to embrace in the UK if he was going to take that position and he has agreed to put those individuals to a side in order to pursue media attention mm -hmm. because as you will appreciate in order to attract media attention in the UK you have to off sort of deposit true conservatives you have to be willing not to articulate the things that need to be said you have to be willing not to to criticize Islam. You have to be willing not to talk about migration. And Nigel Farage gave up on all of those topics when he was seeking power. Uh, and I think that's, that was the beauty of Thatcher, is she didn't flinch from the difficult stuff. That's interesting, Katie. I'm, I, I have to admit, I'm mildly surprised. I, I thought you were going to either say Boris Johnson or Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, um, <laughs> Rees-Mogg is... Uh, He's a caricature and a fun one and a gentleman and those things are charming, uh, but they don't make him Thatcher. Sure. And Boris Johnson has sadly been so incredibly disappointing since lockdown. After his election in December, he was fantastic. He was phenomenal. Um, but after March, something happened to Boris Johnson. I don't know what visit these leaders get. I don't know what they get offered. I don't know what they get shown. But something happened end of March with Boris Johnson and he turned on a dime and he started to do the same playbook as we saw a little bit in America till Trump got back in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had our own Fauci. Uh, lockdowns now are more severe than ever. They are relocking down the nation as we speak. Uh, Britain is a shadow of its former self. And my fear is that we may still not get Brexit. Right. And so Boris Johnson has been, a, and bear in mind, you know, uh, this has been a very, very dark time for the UK. And, and most of the emails I get out of the UK are asking me how people can leave, how they get out. When am I coming back? 
because um, not that I'm some kind of archangel of uh, salvation, but people feel very, very alone and they don't see a way through in the UK. You know, we, we look to you guys right now for hope. Hmm. And um, one of my messages on the road is that I, I don't speak for anybody but myself. We're, we're clear on that. But there are 20 million great British people who are cheering you on, who love America, who love your freedoms, who love your, your Second Amendment. And, and hear us. And we're sorry for the impression that the Muslim mayor of London gives. And that is not who we are at all. Uh, Sadiq Khan. Yeah, don't get me started. <laughs> special, yeah, special little man. Yeah, truly. Well, actually, that, that funnels quite nicely into what uh, the next topic. Um, yes, I do want to discuss Islam, Islam and, and migration. Um, I'll ask you the same question. I, I'm guessing that you're probably familiar with Peter Hitchens. The, the columnist and yes, journalist. I had the, the great it's honor of, time. yeah, I, I like him very much. I had the great honor of interviewing him uh, a few years back, which was amazing. Um, and uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked him. Uh, in plain words, how has Islamic influence affected daily life in England, in the UK, I should say? Mm. In plain words, uh, Islam has taken over our country. Our country will fall to Islam within 10 years. Far already gone. Islam came to conquer our nation and it did it very effectively. Mm -hmm. And before we even realized it was happening, it was already a success. Everything they needed to do was done before we saw it happening. The very foundations, the fabric, the scaffolding of our nation was taken before we opened our eyes and many still will not. And so now we find ourselves on the precipice of the end of Christian or Western culture in the UK, but certainly Christian culture. We're no longer truly a Christian nation. Mm. It's the reason my country did not give asylum to Asia Bibi when she needed it, because uh, a Christian woman uh, who was going to be and will be, I believe, killed by Islamists. We did not give her refuge because... We were told it might upset local communities. <laughs> Sudanist poor. Uh, our white daughters are preyed on and targeted for abuse by Pakistani, majority Pakistani Muslim men, mm. as part of the sexual warfare against us. Um, and we are truly overrun. And it is very dark. And as much as I like to think of myself as the joy and the light and the funny girl and the one that will make us laugh, you know, there, the truth of my nation is dark and I have to tell it straight. And there is no hope for white British nationals. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was, I was going to say, yeah, and it's, it's for me, because I, I, I share your view, uh, Katie, certainly in, in England, and I've written a few articles for Laura Loomer about Islamic influence here in America. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about her. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I love her. And um, I think it's always important that when, when you and I or Laura or anyone are crit is criticizing Islam, we're not criticizing Muslims as people. We're criticizing an ideology that has certain logical and conse consequences and conclusions, right? Um, so I think piggybacking off of that, I'd like to ask you, um, are you, and this is probably inculcated in your, in your previous answer, but are you optimistic about where England is heading or uh, pessimistic? Yeah, and I should make clear, I'm criticizing Islam, but in the case of majority Pakistani Muslim men, I'm criticizing them too. Sure. Anybody that thinks they can target a young white girl because she's dirty, because she's uncovered, I'm criticizing the imams that teach that my daughters are dirty. I'm criticizing women who stay inside and let their husbands treat my daughters in this way. I am criticizing the individuals and I go up against them face to face often. Um, so that's important for me to clarify. There is no hope for the UK. Okay. Fall to Islam. Seven schools are now Muslim children. Mm. But...
is find it and that my Jewish friends, families in London and elsewhere are leaving for Israel. So in Paris, they're, they're further down the dark path than us. Jews are actively hunted in Paris. They are leaving 8,000 left Paris last year. There will not be Jews in Paris within the decade. Hmm. So Jewish families are leaving for Israel and British families are looking, I hear them every day, asking where to go. And many look to Hungary and Poland. And that building group in the Eastern European bloc, Hungary, Poland, Croatia, it's building and it's building firm and solid. It's even shaped like a heart. Hmm. If you look on a map and squint a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I know is that we will retreat. We've learned it from South Africa. You, you retreat to defendable space and Christianity will not die in Europe. It will retreat to Eastern Europe and one through sport again. Uh, but in my lifetime, I, I am actively looking for reasons that involve my family in terms of us being hunted, but also more generally, a new place to, to call home. Um, and I did create a documentary on this called Homelands. And it was about, it's something that media will not talk about, but all of us actually, and Americans too, are looking for a new place to call home. Mm -hmm. And if someone took the trouble to document the movement of people in America, you know, that graphic would be born in Arizona, Nevada, Florida. And it's not just taxation that does that to a nation. Sure. People want to be amongst their own kind. You know, we want to be amongst our own kind. That's not a bad thing. And I want that for my family too. Yeah, absolutely, Katie. Um, let's talk about that, that dirty word nationalism for just a minute, if that's all right. Um, sure. yeah, it's, uh, you know, obviously people's thoughts on the, on the word and the concept depend, depend on how they define it. Right. Um, I guess I'll ask you, Katie, if you see a difference between the words patriotism and nationalism. Yeah. So I think there's something about patriotism mm. that's about the kind of, um, you know, if I think about, oh, okay, I'm a patriot, what does it mean? And to me, it's an active thing, right? Uh, I want to actively go and fight for my country. All that is British. I want to defend other British people. I want to go and uphold my flag. I want to uphold the freedoms that my people have. I want to uphold all the things about being British that I hold dear, right? Those are, that's my patriotic values that I want to go and uphold, the right to hold the door open for someone, to be manly to someone, for my kids to be respectful and orderly and to obey law and order and you know, to be a triumphant about the fact that British people are great and our nation is <laughs> great and we should rule Britannia and rule the waves and that we are proud and we are sovereign. Right. All of that stuff. That's very Brexit as well. That's being a patriot. Separate to that, being a nationalist as I am, I believe multiculturalism has always been and will always be a lie. I believe a diversity in the diversity. Um, there is no such thing as multiculturalism, actually. Hmm. And when people come to my country, and even in the migrant camps, you know, before they get there, and I've spent a lot of time in migrant camps, we have this notion, and it's a romantic one, that people come to join our countries because they have this ideal of of starting over a new life, you know, the American dream, whatever. Assimilation. In reality, yeah. In reality, that's an old fashioned notion. Migrants come, they bring every single enmity and old hostility with them. In the jungle, the migrant camp in Calais, in the border on Fra in France, between on their way to England, the Eritreans don't speak to the Syrians who hate the Afghanis, who refuse to go near the tents of the Iranians, hmm. who don't go near the Somalis. They hate each other. And when they arrive, they all live separately. I could take you. I could take you by the hand and I could show you in London. I could take you to the Somali quarter. I could take you to the 
you know, Afghani quarter to the blocks, the tower blocks that are specifically for Iranians. And it's the same in Cedar Riverside in Minneapolis, for goodness sake. Multiculturalism doesn't exist, hmm. which is why nationalism makes sense. We want to be with our own because when we're with our own, we feel at home. And the thing people want more than ever thirst at the moment, it's like it's like there's a drought and I want to put water on people. The <laughs> thirst is to feel like you're home. And um, Trump's a big part of Trump makes people feel like they came home. And I'm proud to be a nationalist. I want Britain for British people. I would like to put British people first. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem at all. Really, think British nationals and those who have chosen to assimilate with us, like our Indian diaspora, should be at the front of the line. Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, I'm, I remember Peter Hitchens going, going back to uh, Islam in the UK. I remember one of the things Peter Hitchens said to me was uh, apparently uh, Muslims have started a um, uh, Sharia courts in England and they've grown an alternative legal system, which is more and more becoming the standard yeah. as Islamism is is um yeah. t taking over be under, you know be under no illusion you know sharia courts <clears throat> are prevalent the muslim community sort their problems out in their own courts uh, the sharia courts the mo more dark thing is that um we had incidences of these young white british girls being um targeted by majority pakistani muslim grooming gangs rape squads yes those girls there. there is a Muslim police force and the Muslim police would take them the the girls to the Imam to try to resolve the issue now that is not a system of law and order that any American will recognize that is a system going on in the UK I have it on first-hand authority from serving police officers that Imams get to pick the police officers that are they will allow to police the areas around their Muslim community and the mosque. That's what's going on in the UK. That's what's coming and is already prevalent, I believe, in Minneapolis. Uh, Muslims take power, take control, and they take away any... and they hollow them out from the inside. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Unreal. Um, uh, and just to call it out, Kate, I know you have a hard stop uh, so I know we have about 20 minutes left here. I just wanted to let you know I was... That's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, for just a moment, I'd like to discuss our, our mutual friend, uh, Laura Loomer. Um, as I mentioned previously, Yay. I... Yeah, yeah. I'm a columnist for her. She was previously one of my interviewees, um, and I love her to death. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you were recently on, on campaign for her. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I'd love to just maybe get your thoughts uh, quick. What do you think of Laura Loomer and her campaign for Congress? Yeah, so um, and I'm going to be really blunt here as if Laura was sitting with us, right? So I went to live in the campaign house, and so it became hashtag living with Laura. Right? <laughs> so, and the campaign house is literally a house they rented. Uh, the campaign manager is not lives in the house um, they've also got the, another of the campaign staff a very serious credible gentleman in the house and then they've got Milo like it's it's the crazy house but <laughs> I moved in like the mother the mother hen and the neighbours were really excited they were like oh <laughs> the mum are you a mum and I was like no I'm not the mum but I'll take care of all this <laughs> so it was funny and um, let me say Laura Luma may have had, and I would I would be one of the ones that would said, look, Laura could be a little too Lumery, right? Laura could be a little whoop whoop on the edge of things, and I and I'm pretty extreme, but you know, Laura is known for being kind of wild and doing things. You know, I'm Laura Luma, and I'm going to stand in your yard and bring migrants to your yard, Nancy Pelosi, like kind yeah. of crazy, yeah, in a great way. I went into that campaign house, and I could not believe the difference. Laura Luma is, not only is she changing, growing and whatever we have to do, she's surrounded by a serious team of political operators. Like her campaign strategist, Karen, 
is the Trump campaign strategist for Florida back in 2016. Oh. She won Florida for Trump. She is a New Jersey girl. She is tough. And she's about five foot high. <laughs> like, if you want to be frightened, she's the girl. Then they've got up a campaign lead who's from Alabama but works in D.C. Very serious political operative. And my point here is Laura Luma not only is changing and is serious and is dedicated and is working so hard, I can't, I can't praise her work ethic enough. She's surrounded by people who know what they're doing and she's listening. I mean, you and I would both be a little surprised by that. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I'll do it myself, like Mom says, I'm a, she is, she's really switching it up. That's and, awesome. Uh, she's got a chance. She's got a chance. Uh, it seems impossible. But listen, when was the impossible ever, you know, in 2020, you know, when did the impossible become something that couldn't happen, right? Right, exactly. She is working really, really hard. So I have to say I came away impressed. I saw her do the speech of her life at Ampfest. And she has got a woman on her, on her, I won't use the phrase ass, but she's got a woman on her heels who is not letting her out of her sight. And, it, and it's really impressive to watch. That's awesome, Katie. Thanks. Yeah, I wish her, I wish her the best. I love her to death. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and also, just, and the, you know, we should probably say, as a, as a, someone you know, seven years, eight years of knowing Laura, she's a sweet soul. Incredibly nice. Incredibly kind. Um, people always ask me. Kind. Yeah, people always ask me, is is there anything I could tell them about Laura Loomer that might surprise them? I think people would be surprised by how sweet and kind she is. That's not a dig at Laura, just the nature of her job and what she's been through. You'd think she'd be a bit more hard-nosed, right? But yes. no, she's, yeah, you know, I couldn't. That's exactly it. And I think it's also an appearance thing, right? And, and I get that too. Like people meet me and they're like, oh, you're kind of tiny and you're kind of, you know, people think I'm a monster and you uh, monsters <laughs> have to be big. Same for Laura, right? She gives the impression of being hard and sometimes the outward appearance is quite, you know, the makeup and the suit and the heart. Mm -hmm. But the Laura behind that what remembers someone's sister and the hair color of someone's sister and then invites the sister backstage to say hi, you know, supports her colleagues, is loyal to Alex. You, you bring Alex Jones on, ask yep. him. You know, you bring Milo on. What are those boys? You bring Gavin or the Proud Boys on. They'll say she's loyal mm -hmm. despite being told, oh, you can't. I... Uh... <clears throat> Laura is something people should speak of. No, with, without question. Yeah, I, I messaged Milo for an interview. He hasn't responded. <laughs> so hopefully. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's my. You see, as the mother of the house, I'm already like, oh, I'm so sorry for my son. That's very, very poor. I'll tell him off. That's what it's been like in that house. <laughs> That's funny. Um. Let me see. Uh, da, 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 15 minutes. Perfect. Um, obviously, I want to discuss uh, one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on, uh, Katie. You're on kind of a world tour right now. Uh, and I think I'd like to get there by asking you, what would you say is your great cause at the moment? Um, what, what, what are you campaigning for that you greatly and especially care about? Yeah, uh, and that really changed. So I wanted to come fight for Trump and I was determined to, I'm British people aren't allowed in America, uh, but I was determined to get here to join the fight for Trump. But actually what happened, I, and I didn't really know what that meant other than I was just going to come and do a Katie and face down the enemy and whatever. But what it's actually meant is that I realized that we're all hurting and we need to be together. And when our side is together, we realize something. We, we thought that what they did to us was made us wear these stupid masks or shut down our business or told us we couldn't go to work or we we're not allowed to visit our mother. Right. But what they actually took from us was our joy of being together, the noise of people chatting in a room and that, you know, that background, the, 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 the hubbub, the of our faces, the ability for our side to fill each other up, you know, like a car or a, what do you call them when you go to a garage? What do you call it when you put fuel in your car? Do you call it a garage? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Station. <laughs> garage works. <laughs> right. 
So when we put fuel in our car, I'm trying to get the Americanism. I don't have it. <laughs> That's what our side does when we're together. That's what Trump big things used to do. We fill each other up. And that's what my new mission has become. And the fight for freedom has never been more acute than at a time of lockdown, particularly in Democrat-run states. Yeah. Uh, the joy of breaking through that. I have events nearly every day, every other day, uh, where oftentimes they're the first events since lockdown. Uh, when I go to LA in a couple of weeks, there's three events there. It will be their first event since lockdown. And even though they asked me to come by Zoom and appear by Zoom, I, I said, listen, I'm there. Let's God, let's, let's find a, a guard. Let's find a car park. Right. Be there. And they're doing it. And that's the joy. And, and oftentimes people say to me, Katie, what can we do for freedom? You know, what do we do as individuals? What do we do? You know what you do right now? Go. Go to a flag waving. And I promise you, when you get home, you'll say, that was fun. Come to an event. You can wear your mask, wear a visor, wear a suit if you want. We don't judge. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Just come feel better. Let us make you feel better. Come home. And my message to individuals, you know, really important is that at this moment in time, acutely, more than ever before, your individual fight in this battle for freedom is to live your life as freely as you can mm -hmm. and and that that's so joyous and and sure america's locked down but have i been to 12 states and spoken at you know 40 events and come miles it's possible and time for um you know defiance polite mm -hmm. defiance you know the time for waiting to be given an answer is over and the time for waiting per for permission is through. And the most important thing we can do is look after each other, get people to hold on and get people together. And that's what I'm doing tomorrow at a New Jersey rally for 1,500. Uh, then in Gainesville, Florida, the day after at a, a group that's now 700 strong. Wow. You know, we are, this is the movement. This And when it's over, you know what? I think I'm just going to lie down broken hearted on the road. <laughs> This will, really, I'm starting to feel that nervousness of what happens when this ends because it's been a it's been a whirlwind, but it's been so much joy, um, and I've loved it, and and I look forward to coming back to uh, Minnesota and Minneapolis as well because I believe we're going to turn Minnesota red. I I agree with you, Katie. I actually have a bet with a, a Democrat friend of mine that we're going to turn Trump for Minnesota, Minnesota for Trump, I should say. So I got fifty bucks riding on that. <laughs> um. No, and uh, <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, yeah, and you have an event coming up here in Blaine. Um, maybe you could talk yeah. about that. When when is that scheduled? Yeah, so it's on the nineteenth, and I, I guess you guys maybe will be able to um, push the link for people um, yes. so that they can uh, grab a hold of that just to register. So on the nineteenth, I'll be back. Uh, do sign up and and come along. Um, don't be concerned at all if you want to sit separately and if you want to wear whatever you can wear full scuba kit if you want it doesn't matter in fact if you're a democrat or you think you're going to vote biden or you've always been a democrat and hate trump please come come even if you hate me um come um because that's the fun of this thing and and we can all leave you can leave feeling the same way no one's going to try to persuade you otherwise but i know that the conversations that we'll have really matter Mm -hmm. And uh, no one will. I felt I left on business. Yeah, so the nineteenth, um, back in Blaine. I'm not entirely sure where Blaine is, <laughs> but Blaine is where I will be, and I will trust you to put the link up for people to to register. And I, I'd love to see people there. And I, I promise you, whatever else you go away with, you will go away having laughed a lot, and you'll go away feeling better. Uh, and so please do come along. Yeah, no, be a pleasure. Um, yeah, happy to happy to to post the link and thank uh, you. oh, of yeah, course. Thanks. And and I and just for our audience, I had the pleasure of uh, of watching going to Katie Hopkins' <laughs> event. In, it was Hopkins and Hopkins, wasn't it? Hopkins, Hopkins. <laughs> um, and yeah, I you'll you'll have a lot of fun. Uh, she's she's funny. She's a great speaker. Great stories. Um, and you know, no one's gonna try and shout her down or cancel her. So it's all good vibes all around, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a blessing. But thank you for saying those things. Yeah, I really look forward to seeing everyone there. Brilliant. 
Um, all right, Katie, uh, I know we have uh, just a few minutes left. I only have just a, a couple questions left, and then uh, you're no longer oh, my prisoner. <laughs> Ah, I'm no prisoner. <laughs> um, so, Katie, obviously you've been interviewed many times over the years by people, you know, better looking and more charming than me. Um, I'm curious, has there been a question that hasn't been asked of you that you wish someone would ask? <laughs> uh, people's looks and charms are, are nothing to me, my darling. So don't put yourself down. You're very fabulous. And I oh. love your little red shirt. It's very cute. Um, and also you're a very good soul. We've had uh, drinks together. and. Yeah. Um, and you're a lot of fun to be around. In fact, I think you organized the bar that we were in. I did. I, I uh, and I was able to, um, I was the reason you were able to have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I guess one of, you know, I guess one of the things I don't really talk about very much is why I do what I do. You know, why, why would you go through all this? What, you know, I've got children, I've got a husband, I've got a home, sort of. I'm not in my name because they come for it. But right. Uh, why do this? And I think, um, you know, I've been very lucky in my life. I'm, I had chronic epilepsy for a while. A seizure was supposed to kill me. Um, and then I had surgery and I no longer have epilepsy. That happened a couple of years ago. Um, so I was told I had two years to live. And in fact, now I'm already five years over that because wow. my seizures have stopped. And so I, I get extra time. And not only that, in, in partnership with that, uh, because they came for all my stuff. You know, they took my home, they took my jobs, they took my bank account, they took my, uh, well, they came for my kids, didn't get them, came for my hair. But it's she. So when you're not encumbered by the things that we need to protect normally, and you get given extra time, hmm. you know, I, I would argue I'm probably one of the freest people I know. And so I feel that I owe a debt back in this fight. I, I am blessed to have no fear. I don't fear the end and I don't fear when it will come. And I'm not encumbered by things of earthly life. So hmm. um, I, uh, I'm ultimately a free woman. And that's part of the reason people sometimes say, oh, but you, you seem brave or you seem like you, you, you're not scared. And, it's the, and it, when you reconcile with your end early, it makes you very free. Um, so that kind of sits behind me and probably everything I am and how I operate. And uh, and it's why I'm able to just charge face first into the fight. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so so it's all good. You know, the positivity rings through. And I do think we're reaching big politics anymore. This is this is very dark. But yes. out of it comes <clears throat> stuff that's very light. So, so these are epic times, and you know what? I would choose no other time to live through. Like these are the times to be alive, even though sometimes they feel hard. So, it's been an absolute joy. I'm so grateful to America for having me, um, and I think this this has been. Um, if my life ended uh, after Donald Trump gets back into the White House, I would be. I'm very happy with that. I'm reconciled with that. Would be no problem for me. That this fight would have been worth it all the way. Excellent, Katie. I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, last question. If you weren't a columnist and commentator and speaker, what do you think you would be in life, Katie? Yes. Well, I've always wanted to um, be a farmer. Um, oh. My parents, uh, my grandparents were farmers. My family are farmers. We live uh, near farms. And my daughter actually helps run a cow woman at uh, milkman she goes and milks cows she's 14 <laughs> but she wants to be so farming and the land and actually uh, i think it helps you know spend a lot of time with south africans and their fights white south africans and actually you know when it comes to it there's so many parallels with america too god and the land right you talk about your you know one god your family in the land mm -hmm. south africans speak the same way they they believe in god and the land and for me personally, the same. I have faith uh, because of all the things I've been given and I believe in the land and I, and, and that's where I go back to. Whenever things become too hard, I just go back to my little garden or animals and I feel better. So yeah, I would be a farmer and uh, one day I hope to be, you know, I would like to be near back near farms again. So I'm, I'm, the big plan, if, if we're going to be really honest, is that yeah. my daughter marries a farmer. That's the hope. That's ah. the hope. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll keep that in my thoughts. Yeah. Like three kids, but I'm just going to do that. 
<laughs> um, brilliant. Let me see. Uh, Katie Hopkins, how can people find out about you? <laughs> well, they can follow you uh, mm -hmm. because you and I um, will be in contact. Uh, they can be on Parler. Uh, so P-A-R-L-E-R, -E social media site that's sort of a conservative Twitter, I guess. But anybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's at capital K, capital T, Hopkins. And then I would ask people um, if they can tolerate me for a couple hours, come to Blaine on the 19th because I'd really like to see you there. And I would just say one thing, if I may, um, oh, means. regardless of anyone's uh, views or anything, uh, thing at the moment, don't see a way to hold on. Uh, people like me, like you, others, we are here trying to put a sort of a, a rope around your back for you to lean against. Uh, and my kind of thing is go find the thing that you love. So find a photo that you loved from a time that you loved or an outfit that you loved or a memory that you love and hold on to it uh, because there's too many good people out there for us to lose. Uh, these are hard times and I don't uh, underestimate them. But people like me and you are asking people to hold on. And if you're struggling, my email is katie at katiehopkins.co.uk. Um, and it is personal and we're in this fight together, whatever your political views are. Brilliant. Katie Hopkins, I love it. Thank you so much for doing this. This was such a pleasure chatting with you. Oh, well, thank you to your producer for helping us. And uh, thank you to you for uh, making this happen and working with me on timings. And I look forward to seeing you when I'm back in Minnesota. I can't wait. First round's on me. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, all right, Katie, thank you so much. I will, uh, I will let you go. Thank you. Bye, loves. Bye, Katie. See you later, love. Bye.